Of course, I'm about 10 years away from an official retirement. Maybe if I don't have any serious health issues, <clears throat> I'll go on a bit longer. Uh, but you know, we all have to be thinking about these things. And I bring that up because 15 minutes ago, we heard a comment or two on the, uh, during one of the breaks from Waddell and Reed. Waddell and Reed here in Twin Falls. Now, I've got to tell you, Waddell and Reed has been in business since 1937. For you uh, folks listening out there, that's 80 years, right? I mean, you can do the math very quickly in your head. One of the oldest firms that offers mutual funds, Waddell and Reed owns and manages two mutual fund families and invests by a conservative nature. Waddell and Reed, you could say, knows what it's doing because, well, 80 years is pretty good, uh, pretty good track record. Waddell and Reed will take a more planning approach and take a look at each piece of the puzzle for clients, building proper expectations. They'll build those plans around your needs and your goals. Waddell and Reed will help you manage the money. And it takes planning personally. 935, Bill Colley with you this morning on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. I maybe I was I was doing something in the kitchen last night and I was listening in the background and I believe someone said that, you know, Rick Perry is the guy who's going to have the easiest or you know, he he'll have the easiest treatment in Washington because he didn't seem to ruffle too many feathers. It is his goal eventually to become energy secretary, but also to shut down the energy department, which would be a pretty cool thing. A lot of people out there say it, it's absolutely unnecessary. A lot of people believe Betsy DeVos's job is simply to take over the Department of Education and over the years, uh, during the next four years, just turn over the role of educating kids back to local governments, local school boards, turning it over to the states, and that she'll eventually shut down the Department of Education She's out of committee now. I believe Jeff Sessions has been voted out of committee uh, because Democrats are simply boycotting. So committee chairs, Orrin Hatch, just went ahead and pushed, uh, pushed Sessions over the finish line. And despite their attempts that they'll try on the left to, uh, to filibuster, thanks to Harry Reid, I thought I'd never say that, but thanks to Harry Reid, they have the ability to pull the plug on any filibuster now that the Republicans are in control. And the media will scream about that for a few days and, oh, you need to think like we do, and this is very bad for democracy. Ignoring the fact Harry Reid was the guy responsible and that it was okay when it was done to Republicans, who media wants you to know are bad, 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 bad. But we don't, we don't need to waste time on this. We need to get these people confirmed and get them in charge of their departments and just don't let the grandstanding go on. Just get it out of the way. 937, Bill Colley with you on Top Story, and you're up next. You're on the air on KLIX. Yeah, Bill. Uh, sorry to throw things off track for just a second, but I'm your Stone Age listener, and I am not online. Uh, but <laughs> you, uh, so I can't find this out myself. But you mentioned that uh, Steve Bannon uh, is an ex naval officer. Uh, yeah. Could you? Uh, do you have any more details as to what he did or what his rank was? Or not in the USA Today did? story? No, uh, just that he was an officer. Uh, for seven years, and when he left the Navy, he went to work uh, after going through, I think, uh, getting an MBA from one of the, uh, I think it might have even been Harvard. He ended up going to work on Wall Street for a number of years and then drifted over to the editorial board at Breitbart. I see. Okay, thanks a lot, Bill. I want to thank you for the call, too, as well. I do understand there are people out there who, well, if you don't have to be online, I'm not making fun of anybody who who isn't, uh, because I was one of the last of my uh, social circle to ever get a computer, I was the last in my social circle to get a smartphone or even a cell phone, and uh, and I just I didn't see the need for spending a lot of money on all of these things, because I tell the story. My parents didn't have uh, we didn't have cable growing up, so television was free over the air. We always got discounts on them because my uncle sold them, and for a brief period, my dad actually uh, he ran one of the stores, but we didn't have to worry about cable bills, so you weren't throwing away money in that situation every month. Um, you didn't have uh, you didn't have these uh, fancy telephone plans, and you know you had one telephone with a landline coming into the house. So people were likely they were ahead back in those days because they didn't have all of these extras. I mean, you, it's like having an extra utility bill now to have all of these the television and internet and all of those things in the house. And it also is a great distraction. It takes up a lot of your time while you're watching cat videos all day when you could be doing something else. I, I so I admit all of that. Uh, but for me, for the job, it has become a necessity. Just, uh, I've got to do all the social media. I wouldn't do social media if it wasn't for the job. That is the Facebook 
and the LinkedIn and the Twitter and the Instagram. And I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. And, you know, we're not, we don't have regular eight hour work days anymore because we're constantly plugged into all of this and we're expected to be doing all of this 24 seven, seven days a week. Uh, that's why I guess I said 24 seven. Okay. I got it. I'm re- being redundant. Uh, but yeah, Bannon has an incredible resume and, I think he's a man worth listening to. He's not saying let's go to war with China. He's not saying let's go to war with the Muslims. He's saying we probably will be. All right, well, let's start making plans if that ever happens. It's called caution. It's 26 right now. More coming up in just a moment. Bill Cowley with you on Top Story on KLIX. I'll point out as well about uh, Bannon's background that USA Today doesn't like him. But USA Today did report that he was greatly admired by his superiors and his underlings and and those fellows that he served with, men and women, I guess we should say, in the Navy. So if they're making that admission, then I I guess it's, it's, you know, probably grudgingly they made that admission. 25 right now, Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX and NewsRadio1310.com. I just caught this news flash. California, the state of California is moving to going to pass a law to tell police officers in the state not to cooperate with immigration services. The entire state will become a sanctuary state. Now, California has said it may secede from the union, and good riddance. On the other hand, if you've got this huge population, you've got 40 million people there, I guess they'd have to understand, because of all the welfare you know, chiselers in that state, They were partly responsible. In fact, they have a huge share of the $20 trillion debt that this country has. So if California wants to secede, then as a proportion of the population, more than a tenth of the the country lives in California. So they may be on the hook for, what, $3, $4 trillion of that debt? As long as they're willing to take care of their fair share, they can go any time. I think that's, make it clear to them, though, that they were responsible for that and see how well that goes over. You can continue to try and defy federal law. Uh, that's what uh, you know happened uh, when uh, South Carolina decided to attack Fort Sumter, but it brings a really bad reaction sometimes. And I got news for you. It took the South 100 years to recover. 943, Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX, and com. More news from liberal La La Land. Uh, The Daily Signal, the truth behind the Solar Jobs Report. Have you ever heard of this? There's an organization in Washington called the Solar Foundation. I guess they worship the sun. And it's a nonprofit group. It's going to release its latest annual report showing growth figures for solar jobs while it also warns against policies that could result in layoffs. In other words, they want you to continue to pay for this with a $20 trillion debt. The hard reality is, the writer at Daily Signal says, Even as solar energy became politically fashionable, it remained economically unsound. And then it says, just ask Elon Musk. He's a South African who has a renewable energy company. That is, he's building electric cars. You know, he went to Washington last week and spoke in favor of a carbon tax. Why? Because it would fund his company, which he can't make money on otherwise. In other words, he wants you to pay for his profit. Crony capitalism, it's called. Or how about Fisker Automotive, which Joe Biden set up with a nice... uh, fat uh, paycheck from the taxpayers, and it never built a car uh, in, in, in Delaware where he set it up at in his home state. Uh, this is what we're dealing with with these people, and again, they're not going to go quietly. We are going to be in a pitch battle with them as long as Trump is president and well beyond. We have a caller with us. Just a quick note before I get to the caller. The number is 736-0300. That's 736-0300. We're at 25, and you're up next. You're on the air. Well, Bill, for over 100 years, dating back to the early 1900s when the Federal Reserve was, Act was passed, income tax was passed, a tax-free foundations, a direct election of senators, there were four really bad things happened around 1913. And, and then the media, basically, all we had was newspapers. So the, the elitists said, how are we going to convince people that we need this global government, which we're going to, of course, head up. And so they got control of the 25 top editorial boards, and you can still name those papers today um, around the country. And so 
we didn't get the League of Nations. They failed, so um, that was supposed to be the result after World War One. So I guess we got to get another war. So we had World War Two, and then the United Nations came on. And Alger Hiss was the first, you know, to, um, Secretary General of that, and later convicted of a communist spy. The UN has been our enemy of this country since its inception. It's been anti-American. So we get the refugee program. We get the climate change agenda 21. We get common core. You name the bad program that we now see in our local schools, basically. And all that's garbage is coming around the UN. But then in the fifties, Norman Dodds was a special investigator for the Reese committee. And he went out to the tax free foundations to ask how, uh, why they were supporting socialist causes around the, the planet. And so H. Roland Gaither, he was the president of the Ford Foundation, said, well, we're under directive so that basically create this country into a third world country. So, I mean, this thing has been going on. We've had this fifth column of communists. Our growers here in the Magic Valley uh, have been really impacted by uh, Harry Bridges, a communist, and the longshoreman strike, it killed our you know, basically exports uh, with the slowdowns and so forth there. I mean, everything they do is to make this country a third world country and bring us down to our knees. And they're really resisting hard when somebody like Trump comes along. But what really gets me, Bill, is that why do these people not see that we were, if we had gotten Hillary... Um, this country would have been toast, totally. And now we have a chance. I think God's given us one last chance, and if we don't support Trump and get on board, um, he's not perfect, but none of us are. So, you know, it's just they want this global, one-world government, everybody under the United Nations umbrella, and we need to get out of that thing. And H.R. 193 would do that. Have you ever heard of that, uh, it's called the Hegelian dialectic, where uh, they create a problem, and then uh, the, the elites create a problem, then they amplify the problem, and then they provide the intended solution. You reference the Longshoreman strike. So you destroy the farming community in certain parts of the country. Then you go and you say, well, this is terrible, and you know, you, 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 you created the problem, it's amplified by the destruction of the farming community, and then you turn around and say, well, I got an idea. We have this thing called the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's 5,000, 6,000 pages long, and it'll help revive your businesses. Uh, but, of course, it's going to help control uh, all of our environmental laws, and it's going to help control our freedom of movement in our own countries. And, uh, and we're just going to have to give more and more of our sovereignty away to these international organizations. That's exactly well, what's going on there. Absolutely. The only out of that Trans-Pacific Partnership... Only five chapters had to do with trade, and, of course, Farm Bureau, all of the organizations here in Idaho, Agger, were in favor of it. But there's 24 chapters have to do with economic political merger, and so Trump did the right thing and just kiboshed it real quick, you know, put his foot on it and said, it's gone, and let's negotiate trade on a separate basis. And most of us are not against trade. I mean, we need trade, but NAFTA is just absolutely – we're bringing in – uh, I think 254,000 tons of sugar is coming in from Mexico, and it's depressing our sugar beet prices, so um, the ton he just did to get. So we're being impacted negatively mostly by these trade agreements, and, and yet we seem to go back to the same losing formula, and somehow the media convinces our farmers and ranchers that these things are, are, are salvation. But we, we have to realize the big picture. The big picture is to make us a third world country so that we can be controlled and be under the umbrella of the United Nations. And if we got out of that miserable organization, because it it is out to destroy us internally, externally. And uh, it, it's really sad, but I've been studying this for a long, long time. And it's just really uh, important for people to understand and this new Supreme Court justice, man, that's a breath of fresh air for sure. Yeah. And uh, he, he really can go on. Uh, I, you know, I, 
I, I, you know, McConnell's probably going to have to do the nuclear option on Brett Barrett. Don't stuff. waste any time doing it, Ben. Just go ahead. I mean, that, yeah. that the, don't even give these people an opportunity to grandstand because they're not yeah. going to. Media is going to beat you up no matter what you do. So just get it out of the way, get it done, and yeah. in a few months from now, we have a new sitting justice. Just do the nuclear option, Harry Reid, uh, set the precedent, and uh, so just you know, forget all of grandstanding and, and having him go through all this torture chamber that the Democrats are going to bring up, and uh, just get it done. And because you only need 51 votes with the nuclear option, and there's going to be enough Democrats, it's going to be hard to get 60. Um, but maybe some of them will reconsider because they're up for re-election yeah. this next time around. So that's another you know thing that's against them. But this country is the greatest country in the history of the world. And yet we just sit back. So many people just don't want to get involved. They don't want to, they just listen to NPR radio, which is anti-Trump, anti-American. They and paid for to, it with my tax dollars. Yeah. You know, it's just, uh, it's really sad that the sources of news, uh, if you don't, haven't studied the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Independence and our founding fathers as to what was really in the hearing engine. And they say, well, we don't know what there is. And I've got two volumes that Madison wrote himself of all the notes that were taken during the Constitutional Convention. We know exactly what they meant. And they, you know, they've just twisted things around like separation of church and state. Um, you know, they took prayer and Bible reading out of school and it's been a moral abyss ever since, Bill. Well, thank you much for the telephone call. It's going to be a serious, serious challenge to try to turn it around. Trump is, is a good start, and some of his choices are great starts. But with the pushback we're seeing, and as I mentioned earlier, Rob Port, the political writer from North Dakota, has said the left has already gone on a scale of 1 to 10. They've gone to 11. So what's their next move? Because this didn't work. You know, their efforts the last week didn't work. And I'm telling you, smashing windows and uh, stopping people from getting on airplanes, uh, rioting in the streets, setting fires, that's all small right now when you consider where they could go with this. What is the next step they're planning? And will the media be cheering them on as they do this? Likely it will. You know, the media badmouthed the Tea Party brigades. I was there in the beginning. If you read the book, some people give, and, I, I, and I, you know, I'm patting myself on the back here, I know, tooting my own horn. Some people say it was Rick Santelli on CNBC screaming on the uh, floor of the Chicago Board of Trade on, uh, on uh, live TV that we needed to do something. But if you read a book, and it's actually written by a liberal named Will Bunch. He's a columnist for a number of liberal publications around the country. Will Bunch wrote a book called The Backlash, which is about the, 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 the rise of the Tea Party movement. My sister jokes that half the first chapter is about me, but it was about my efforts as a radio talk show host to encourage people to go to a town hall meeting because we had a rhino Republican congressman named Mike Castle, and he had voted for cap and trade. Uh, he had uh, he had uh, he was on board with Obamacare and all of these things, and he would hold these town hall meetings periodically uh, around uh, the state. Uh, when I lived in Delaware, all this happened. He'd hold these town hall meetings, and usually the same twelve suspects would show up and. Hey, Mike, it's good to see you. Thank you for bringing me money from the federal treasury that we all paid into for my pet project. Oh, you're very welcome. Good to see you, and I hope you'll kick back some of that in the form of a campaign contribution. Well, we turned out 300 people for one of his town hall meetings. You may have seen this one. That's where the woman, her name was Crazy Eileen, according to my listening audience. But Eileen was a regular caller to my show. So she showed up, and she held up in a plastic bag, so she had it sealed so it could be protected she said, this is my birth certificate. I'd like to know if President Obama can produce his. Now, I didn't. I was not a birther, but it was. I was sitting about three rows up front, and I was just thinking, oh, this is, this is certainly putting the congressman on the spot. And then people said, they forced him to say the Pledge of Allegiance. Well, no, he actually said, I'll be glad to say it. Do you want me to lead? The media, they'll try to twist that around. Uh, but the, the book is all about how I turned that crowd out and how it eventually ended up in the defeat of that rhino in a primary the following year. June 30th, I think it was, in 2009, and it led to his defeat the following year. So Will Bunch wrote this book, and he described how this all got started at the grassroots level. Because media tried to tell you, well, this was actually all being funded by the Koch brothers. I never met them. 
my friend Steve Heil, the colonel who joins us periodically on various topics on the air, and we have a conversation. Steve, uh, myself, a woman named Christy Shirey, a woman named Donna Gordon, and a friend of ours named Kevin. That was it. We were it. We got it all organized, and we got the ball rolling in our state. And so Will Bunch describes how all this came about in his book, and, and that was the beginning of all of it. But we were vilified as being racists and bigots and violent, and there was no violence at any of our events. We were actually very calm, and we were cool and collected, and we cleaned up. The park police used to tell us at all of our big events, how I'll never forget the Glenn Beck rally where we picked up all of our own garbage and put it in bags and got it all taken care of and got it out of the way. And we walked down the we walked down the mall. We were headed back to our buses, and Al Sharpton's counter demonstration had been there, and they dumped all of their pop cans all over the World War II memorial, all over. You know, you walk in that ring, that hallowed ground, and they dumped their signs there. I'm surprised they didn't pull out a roll of toilet paper and decide to take a dump in the middle of it. And media said, "Oh, Al Sharpton really showed those racist bigots today." After they desecrated the monument to the greatest generation in our nation's capital, you're right. And then the Occupy demonstration came along, and they were raping people in tents, and people were getting killed in the encampments, and they were crapping in the streets of our cities and on police cars. And media said, well, but this is a necessary protest. And now you've got these kids smashing windows in Washington and burning the limousines owned by immigrants and, 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 you know, and beating up on the immigrant drivers of the limousines and blocking people from getting on airplanes, and, and who knows what else they'll do. And media keeps saying that's acceptable. And you wonder, who's controlling all of this? Where are they getting their money? And if you even dare say it's Soros, media calls you a crazed bigot. Well, it's pretty easy for me to see who is the calm voice in all of this and who are the calm people in all of this versus what we're up against. This is going to continue. Mr. Trump is in grave danger. The people around him are in grave danger. The people who support him are in grave danger. You don't want to get into the middle of one of these mobs, trust me. This is our future for, as far as I can see, going ahead. And I don't know how it comes to an end. But as Steve Millington quoted me yesterday, we have to be uh, very vigilant or forever vigilant. Because our generation has been lucky enough to be the chosen to try and turn this, this, this great ship of state around. God willing, if the creek don't rise, they'll allow me to come back.